Dr. Burke. Thank God for you. I'd like to thank Pastor Dennis for having me out here this afternoon, this morning. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mother Johnson for coming out years ago and uh, getting me to know uh, Pastor Jennings, actually. I'd like to thank my wife for coming out and my son. You can see a resemblance, maybe. Uh, he's helping uh, doing some technical support this morning. But anyway, I'll probably be moving around. I think I have a free mic because um, I want to be able to explain what I'm going to be presenting to you on the screens. I'm going to try to put this whole thing in order and as easy to understand as can be within an hour. Then we're going to give a, about a half hour question to answer. So if you got questions, if you don't have anything to write them down, try to remember them, we'll deal with those questions. Uh, cancer. I named this topic uh, Cancer uh, So Understood uh, because it's been around for as long as man has been around, I guess. And there's been so many misconceptions about cancer. Uh, in, in my medical training, one of the major things that we consistently hear is that cancer is multifactorial. The, co the cause of cancer is multifactorial. And, and that's true. There are several factors, but there's some key factors that are uh, the major things you need to understand if you're going to make yourself safe against cancer. Because the best cancer is the one you never get. And it can be prevented very effectively. It can be treated, but it can be prevented. Uh, so in order for me to be able to, uh, let's see, am I, you still can hear me? Everything good? Okay, great, great. Uh, Just a little bit about myself, for those who don't know me. Uh, I was born and raised in Philadelphia, uh, graduated from John Bartram High School, uh, graduated from uh, Community College in 1972, graduated from Long Island University in 1976, uh, bachelor's degree in, urban, in uh, sociology, associate degree in urban affairs, graduated from medical school in Nashville, Tennessee, Manhattan Medical College in 1981, and I finished a three-year residency in internal medicine at Providence Hospital in Washington, D.C. in 1984 came back here to Philadelphia and I've been practicing here ever since. Um, first, cancer is a group of diseases. I'm not, this, this is not going to be death by PowerPoint. I'm going to read a few things, but it's not going to be that bad. The, 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 the point I want to make from this slide is that it's a group of diseases involving abnormal cell growth with the potential to invade or spread to other parts of the body. Healthy cells divide in two ways, through mitosis, meaning one cell divides into two, and meiosis. Meiosis is a way of cell division where cells that are germ cells or cells that are going to reproduce a person. Eggs or sperm will divide not one into two, but one into four. It's not important that you remember all that. You're not going to be quizzed on it. I just want to make mention of it in case you read somewhere that that is the case. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, cancer cells also divide, but they don't divide like normal cells. They divide one maybe into three or maybe five. That's abnormal cell growth, and that's what makes cancer different from every other type of normal cell um, division. Cells are des designed to be controlled by the hormonal system and the other controlling mechanisms in the body. Cancer cells don't get controlled. They lose control. One of the things that controls cells is a process we call apoptosis. Apoptosis is the natural programmed cell death. That's going to become very important, especially when we talk about breast cancer toward the end of the, the conversation. So I want you to remember that term. Apoptosis basically means cells are born to die. My mother used to have a saying, you know, you're born to die, son. Nobody lives forever. Well, every cell has a design for when it's supposed to die. And that term is called apoptosis. Certain things have to happen in order for that to happen. Uh, now, what I wanted to explain to you is we are all here, all of us are basically, most of the people in here are adults, and they're made up of about 80 to 100 trillion cells. Now, a cell is a self-enclosed factory that makes protein. Most cells make protein. Some other cells make, like hair cells make hair. Nail cells make nails. 
Bones, bone cells make bone. So cells have to do their job. In order for them to do their job, they have to receive energy to carry out the work. Nobody can work or anything can work without energy. Now, contrary to popular belief, there are only three foods that can supply the cells with the energy and the light to make them able to do their job. Those foods are carbohydrates, which we tend to call starches or sugars, carbohydrates, fats, and protein. So keep those in mind. Don't think about steak or mashed potatoes. It's carbohydrates, fats, and protein. That's what our body's cells need. We all start out as one cell. Think about that. Everyone in this, in this room started out as one cell. A cell so small that if you put it on the head of a pin, you couldn't see it without a microscope. One cell. That cell divided by mitosis into two cells. Those two cells divided into four cells and so on and so forth to get you to the point where you are now at 80 to 100 trillion cells. Uh, next cell. Now, one thing I meant from the last slide I didn't mention is prokaryotic. Prokaryotic is a term that refers to the idea that a cell has to be controlled and the control mechanism is the nucleus. So prokaryotic cells have a nucleus Bacteria are not prokaryotic cells. They're one cell too, but they don't have a nucleus, which is the difference between prokaryotic and what we call eukaryotic cells, like bacteria. Now, as I said, the average adult is made up of about 70 to 100 trillion cells. Just to give you an idea of what that means, I asked the patient this once in the, in the uh, office, and they weren't clear about what trillion meant. So I decided to do this. A million is a thousand thousand. Easy to understand. A billion is a thousand million. A trillion is a thousand billion. Okay? Just so you get the concept of how many numbers we're talking about here. As I said earlier, prokaryotic cells are bacteria. They don't have a nucleus. They don't have a controlling factor mechanism inside the cell. Like human cells mostly do. Uh, here's the thing that's most not known by, by most people, and that is of those 70 to 100 trillion cells, at least half of them are non-human. That sounds kind of strange, right? Non-human cells? Well, that's because all of us know we have bacteria living in our bodies, right? You know that. Okay. Well, Half of the cells that make up our biome, we call it, are actually non-human bacteria. And part of understanding how to be healthy is how to maintain control of those bacteria, control the bad ones, and feed the good ones. So basically, when you're eating, you're eating to take care of your bacteria. Think about that. You're eating to make sure that your good bacteria are well-fed and the bad bacteria are controlled. That's the whole idea here. If you took, now here's the interesting point, because if you, you think about it, you say, well, if half the cells in your body are non-human, then that should be half your weight, right? Not quite. The bacteria are very much smaller than regular human cells. So if you collected all of the non-human cells in your body, they would fill a large soup can. So they're not that large in volume, but they're that large in number. That's the point I want to get to, to you understand. But they're very important. Uh, next one. Okay. Now, good bacteria, probiotics. You've heard that term before, probiotic, correct? Okay. These are the three primary probiotics. Lactobacillus, which is an acid-loving milk bacillus. This is the one that most people get when they eat yogurt. Okay? And the second is the uh, bifidobacterium bifidum. It, it's the one that actually helps you to get, keep from getting uh, 
stomach ulcers, you hear the ulcers in the stomach and that sort of thing, well that's the one that prevents and keeps your stomach lining healthy. And the last one, a streptococcus thermophilus is actually uh, the bacteria they use to uh, make yogurt and mozzarella cheese and other fermented dairy products. Okay, so these are the bacteria that actually live inside you that you're trying to feed to keep healthy. You feed probiotics with prebiotics. And what are good prebiotics? Fermented foods, particularly sauerkraut. I don't know how many people here eat sauerkraut, but that's just one. Now I wanted to start out by talking about a gentleman that I knew, a good friend of mine, he died a few years ago. This gentleman's name is James P. Carter. Dr. Carter was a professor at uh, Tulane University in the Tropical Medicine Department. Became friends with him in 1987. And uh, Dr. Carter wrote a book. And the name of the book is Racketeering and Medicine, The Suppression of Alternatives. Now, what he tried to do with this book is to try to explain to people why medicine is such a difficult uh, industry to control or to get the benefit from. You all know about the stuff that's going on down in Washington with uh, uh, Obamacare and Trump, that whole deal. Well, medicine is a big, 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 big money maker. And cancer is even bigger. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous how much money is made on cancer. The average cancer patient makes about $150,000 for the industry. Think about that, 150 grand. So every cancer patient is worth a lot of money. Well, what he did with this book is try to explain that people who come up with answers for cancer and other chronic diseases are actually suppressed. The industry keeps them down and doesn't want their information to be out there. So he documented many of the, patients, many of the physicians who, over the years, helped to try to heal people and what kind of efforts the government and other uh, industry uh, powers did to suppress their work. Now we go to Brian Scott Peskin. Brian Scott Peskin is a gentleman who uh, is an engineer for M MIT in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he was in the Europe, uh, not Europe, I'm sorry, Asia at a meeting several years ago. And he was, as he said, bored to death with the conversation in the conferences. So one day in the conference, he happened to hear somebody get up and talk about a gentleman named Otto Warburg. He became so fascinated by Otto Warburg that he decided to write a book to explain fully what this guy was about. Next one. This is Otto Heinrich Warburg, uh, Warburg just like Marky Mark, Mark, Mark Warburg, same spelling. This gentleman is a gentleman who was born in the 1800s, and he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1931 because he figured out why cells become cancerous. And it's very interesting what, how he figured it out. But put it in the next cell. These are microscopic pictures of, of cells. These happen to be stomach cells. Here's the next one. These are some other stomachs. These, these are what's still in there. I talked to you about nuclei, nuclei. Those blue circles in the middle, those are the nucleus of cells. Because it's important to understand how that works. Next one. These happen to be red blood cells. Okay? If you looked at a smear in the microscope, this is what a red blood cell looks like. And actually, this is a, not quite as normal a, a picture as uh, you would see in a person that has a great blood picture because the cells don't look as uniform as they should. In, in an ideal slide, they all look like donuts. This is an electron scanning microscope showing you at a higher resolution what cells look like. All part, these are all red blood cells. The red, why red blood cells? Because they carry oxygen. This goes back to what Otto Warburg was pointing out. Oxygen is the whole thing, and red blood cells basically carry about 200, each cell carries about 280 million molecules of hemoglobin. You've heard of hemoglobin before, heme meaning iron, globin meaning protein. Hemoglobin is the protein iron complex that carries oxygen. Each one of those little donut looking things carries about 280 million molecules of hemoglobin which pick up oxygen as they pass through the lungs. 
This is the picture of a, a red blood cell as it squeezed through a capillary. Here's how you understand this, very basic. Blood cells are gauged by large down to small. The smallest blood vessel is a capillary. If you cut your wrist, you will see a blood uh, artery pumping out blood. And you can actually pick it up and see it, and you probably see blood coming out of it. In the capillary, that's too small for you to see. But that's the place where gas exchange takes place, where the red blood cells give up oxygen, pick up carbon dioxide. And that's how small the capillary is. It only allows one red blood cell through at a time. Now, this is a diagram of a cell itself, a, 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 a um, cell that has all of the so-called organelles. Humans have organs, each cell has, not each cell, human cells have organelles. And in the organelles, the nucleus is an organelle, but so are mitochondria. And I wanted to point out here, These orange structures are mitochondria. That's where the energy is produced in the cell for the cell to get its work done. What I want to point out to you before we leave this slide is, is that the outside of the cell has a membrane. We haven't, found, we haven't forgotten Otto. We're going to get back to him. The outside of the cell has a membrane. And that membrane is a very specialized structure. And that's where Otto Warburg's work comes in. Let me show you another picture of how that works. That's another uh, diagram, same kind of a situation, just showing you different organelles. But the point I want to make to you is, is that all of the organelles have a membrane, and there's a membrane encasing the whole thing. Everything that has to do with getting inside the cell has to go through those membranes. This is where all those work came in. This is a diagram of the membrane. Okay, that membrane is made up of fats and carbohydrate, primarily fat, very little protein. Remember I told you the three foods? Fats, carbohydrates, and protein. Now, in order for you to actually receive the oxygen or the food that you consume, they've got to pass through that membrane. Can I another. This is another diagram of a membrane, just to get you in, into your head to understand it. We, we're talking about how these membranes are actually built. And the major component of those membranes is fats, or what we call lipids, or the fats. They're designed so that they allow things to go, some things to go through and some things not to. Sort of like at home, you have a screen, that in the summertime you put your screens up, it allows air to go through, but it won't allow flies and other insects to go through. Well, that's what that what we call semi-permeable membrane will do. It allows certain good things in and not certain things in. Next. Again, another example of how that membrane, different types of membranes. Okay, here's the key to Otto Warburg's whole reason for he got the Nobel Peace Prize in 1931. The red blood cells are traveling from your lungs to the heart, Let's start with the heart, it makes more sense. The heart pumps blood. It pumps the blood to the body and to the heart, I mean to the lungs. When the blood goes to the tissues, it gives up its oxygen because it got through the small capillaries and it got close to the red blood cells. Because I thought about this, if you say to a person, look, uh, I'm breathing because I'm breathing in air. You need air, we're all breathing. So we know air gets into our lungs by breathing. How does it get from the lungs to the cells? I mean, we got 70 to 100 trillion cells. Those cells got to get oxygen. How do you get oxygen to those cells? Well, the capillaries, which is the smallest blood vessels, when those red blood cells go through those capillaries, they get very, very, very close to the cells there. And when they get that close, the cell membrane, which I showed you all those diagrams of, it, uh, it pulls oxygen off of the red blood cells as they pass by, and it gives up carbon dioxide, which is the waste. That's what's produced with the cell using all of its uh, energy to make protein or whatever it makes. The waste product or the garbage is the carbon dioxide. It releases the carbon dioxide and pulls off the oxygen as the red blood cells slither by in the capillaries. Then they go back to the heart, get pumped to the lungs, and as they go to the lungs, 
they give up the carbon dioxide and pick up more oxygen. Then go back to the heart and get sent back to the tissues and reverse the whole process over and over again. Now, how does that make any sense with what I'm talking about? What Otto Warburg found out was that if that membrane is not healthy, it's not going to be able to pull that oxygen off of the red blood cells as it passes by the tissues. Okay, if it can't pull off the oxygen, what's, how's the cell going to make energy? Got to make energy somehow. So the cell has a backup plan for making energy if it can't get enough oxygen. Cell membrane is not healthy enough to pull oxygen, so it's got to do something. It goes through a process of what we call fermentation. And in that process, that becomes cancer. So cancer, in fact, is plan B for getting energy if you can't get oxygen. That's what Otto Warburg found out in 1931 and got the Nobel Peace Prize, okay? This is a uh, diagram saying pretty much what I just told you, that the cells, the red blood cells go back and forth from the tissue to the heart, to the, to the lungs, to the heart, to the tissue, to the heart, to the lungs, to the, back and forth taking carbon dioxide and oxygen. If the cell membranes, as the red blood cells pass by, have enough ability to pull oxygen off of the red blood cells, then they'll have oxygen to make energy, because you need oxygen to make energy. Everybody's seen an experiment where you took a candle and you put a glass over the candle and the candle went out, right? Because you have to have oxygen to, to, to create the energy. So if the cells, the same thing, if the cells don't have enough oxygen, they can't produce enough energy. If they can't produce enough energy that way, they go to plan B, which is cancer. Now, I wanted to bring this gentleman up because he's a very, very important gentleman. The name is Weston Price. He's born in 1870, died in 1948. Probably the greatest dentist that ever lived. Take that back. The greatest dentist that ever lived, no problem. Now, why is he important? He's important in this whole thing because he conducted a study in 1900 to 19, from 1900 to 1925 uh, the American Dental Association asked him if he would conduct a study to see what the safety of root canals was all about. So he did that. So he, he headed up a group of doctors who had multiple clinics around the, the country. And what they did was if the, a patient came into one of their clinics who had any kind of chronic degenerative disease, anything, lupus, rheumatoid cancer, anything, any disease, and had had a root canal put in prior to the onset of that disease, they would take the root canal out of the patient and embed it in the skin of a healthy rabbit. They averaged 500 rabbits a year for 25 years. They watched the rabbit and they watched the patient. The patient would get better, the rabbit come down with the same exact disease the patient had. Interesting, isn't it? In 1923, he published his work. It was 1,174 pages, showing the connection between root canal teeth and chronic degenerative diseases of all kinds. He said the number one disease he saw coming from those teeth was rheumatoid group lesions, or autoimmune diseases, or collagen vascular diseases, or you get connective tissue disease, all of the basic euphemisms for the same process. But he said they were coming from root canal teeth, which were basically uh, a center for infection in the body. Because taking that tooth and taking out the, the blood vessels and the, and the nerve don't solve the problem. They just leave you with a dead tooth. And anything that dies will turn into something else. Now, when he realized that the American Dental Association uh, was not interested in finding out that information about root canal teeth, because all of you heard about that, right? No, isn't that interesting? 1,174 pages, published in 1923, and nobody here heard about it. Okay, that's what he said. It's not going to be heard about. So what I need to do is find out why people get cavities in the first place. So he set out on a trip, him and his wife, and they went around the world examining people's teeth. He said, because if I can pe keep people from getting cavities, I can keep them from getting uh, need for root canals. What he found was, in a nutshell, that the number one cause of tooth decay is not how many dentists you see, or not how many times you floss, or if you use the right toothpaste, Crest versus Colgate, has nothing to do with it. The number one problem causing tooth decay was the consumption of the foods of modern convenience. What are they? White flour, white sugar, white rice, canned food, excess vegetable oil, and caffeine. 
or the foods of modern convenience, as he often referred to them. And he said that the people who didn't eat those foods would have healthy teeth. These are the pictures that he took of people around the world who had healthy teeth who did not eat the foods of modern, consumption, of modern convenience. But then he found people who did. Next one. These are the people who did eat the foods of modern convenience. See the difference? This gentleman is Royal Lee. He was a dentist also. He found, in, he was born in the 1800s also, he found in the 1920s that the agricultural technology was changing dramatically for the worse, and that that technology is going to have a direct negative impact on the health of the population. So he, being a dentist in Milwaukee, purchased a 500-acre uh, farm in Palmyra, Wisconsin, and started growing food organically and developing techniques for uh, harvesting, juicing, vacuum drying, tableting, and encapsulating foods and made alliances with uh, naturopaths, veterinarians, acupuncturists, and the like to develop formulations to help people and animals with chronic illnesses. And he came up with an extensive formulation, learned how to understand how the blood related to nutrition, put together the Lee uh, Memorial Foundation Library, did all of this work, and then the government came in and said, sir, you're practicing medicine without a license. You can't do that. You can be a uh, vitamin company, or you can be a publishing company, but you can't be both. So fortunately for me and you, some of his disciples took up his library work and still have all of his work compiled in California so that people can get that information if they want to. His vitamin company still exists, privately owned, called Standard Process Supplement Company, founded in 1929. It's actually the oldest vitamin company in America. And that's the supplement company I've been using now, one of them, since 1986 when I started doing this work. Max Gerson. Max. Uh, also a German, he was a physician who uh, developed a technology, a technique for treating cancer and chronic degenerative diseases, understanding they are truly multifactorial. But here's how it worked. He had migraine headaches, severe migraine headaches, and he was trying to figure out what he could do to, to fix these headaches. And he somehow, I don't know how he figured this out, but you, you've heard of coffee enemas? I'm sure some of you've heard of coffee enemas. He started using coffee enemas and juicing. You've heard of juicing, right? Okay. He started juicing and using that, uh, those technologies to uh, fix his headaches. And then uh, in the 1930s when he was doing his work, uh, you do know what the number one, well, right now people are talking about AIDS and the like. Well, in the 1930s, TB, tuberculosis, was a big deal. And he decided, since that was such a uh, widespread infection, he would try his nutrition, low-salt diet, took the salt, which is processed food, juicing, and also uh, uh, the coffee enemas to detox, because he found them, you do the coffee enemas, you detox the liver. He was actually able to cure TB that way. Of course, you all heard about that too, right? No, nope, nobody heard about that. Huh? Okay. Well, he was doing that in the 1930s. Then a lady in, uh, outside of Berlin who had stomach cancer summoned him to her home and asked him to try his technique on her. And uh, he was reluctant to do that because even in Germany back in the 1930s, uh, there's a lot of pressure to maintain things the way everybody else does it, not do anything outside the box. But she encouraged him and forced him to do the treatment to her and eliminate her stomach cancer. Then the rise of Hitler, he came to be, and uh, Max Gerson left the country uh, uh, through Austria, came to the United States, set up practice in uh, New York, and was treating people with cancer with his program. In 1946, he was uh, invited to testify in Congress uh, at a Senate Select Subcommittee hearing held by, chaired by Claude Pepper, who was a senator from Florida. And with him, he brought five people who had been diagnosed with cancer, who had been cured with his technology. And one of them was a lady who was from Upper Derby who had been diagnosed with Jefferson, which is where, where I was born. And uh, 
That, that transcript is still available. You can get that. Now we're getting to uh, the part I wanted to help you understand really, really well. This is a gentleman named uh, David Perlmutter. David Perlmutter published a book recently called Grain Brain. David helped me in a, a case I had back about 20 years ago, a patient with LELS, which unfortunately the patient didn't survive, but I did make contact with him. And he has this concept that grain is actually the major culprit in dementia. Okay? That's going to become important in a little while. Can be. This is uh, William Davis. William Davis is a cardiologist out of, uh, uh, I think it's Minnesota, somewhere out in the Midwest. But at any rate, he wrote this book called Wheat Belly. And in his book, he talks about the fact that the number one cause of diabetes, you've all heard of diabetes, is consumption of grains, particularly wheat. And uh, I, I heard him speak, got his book, started to pay attention to what he was saying, and I remember when I was a kid, we always ate a loaf of bread a day to my father, my mother, my two sisters, you know, sandwiches for lunch, toast for breakfast, you know the deal. And then we went from white bread to brown bread, because brown was supposed to be better, right? Okay, well, brown bread actually is uh, worse. We'll talk about that. Now we get to Stephen Gundry. Uh, this book is new. Uh, if you haven't heard of this book, you need to get it, because he's figured it out. The reason I started to really focus on this guy is because I've been watching him on the internet for the past year and a half, and uh, he said he was coming out with this book. So I mentioned it to a patient, and uh, she went out and got the book. She and her husband went on the program. And uh, a short while later, they came into the office looking like brand new money. And I said, uh, what y'all been doing? She said, we followed the program in the book, Doc. He's figured it out. I said, oh, yeah? I said, okay. So I went out that day to Barnes & Noble <laughs> and bought the book and started reading it. And I was convinced this guy's figured it out. Now, you might think, well, well he's, he's coming up with a new concept, right? No. What he's done is he's kind of tied everything together to explain what's really happening so that all these people I told you before, they all fit into a nice little neat puzzle. This slide basically says every living thing possesses the drive to survive and pass on its genes to the future generations. That's what we're all doing. Plants, reg uh, regardless of all, no, no, plants regard all predators, including us, as their enemies. Different concept, folks. Uh, I remember people, my wife tells me all the time, I talk to my plants. I used to kind of poo poo that. You know, you talk to your plants, do they hear you? What, do they talk back? What's the deal? Well, as I read this book, I'm starting to understand that plants do have an intent and a consciousness. Now, I know that sounds kind of strange, right? I, I get it. Hang in there. You hang with me. You'll see. Uh, your job is to find out which plants are your friends and which plants are your enemies. Plants are great chemists and alchemists, actually. Here's the way the deal goes. Plants have been here for millions and millions and millions of years. They've been here. They just ran the whole planet before animals showed up. When animals showed up, animals wanted to eat the plants. Makes sense, right? Well, plants decided they, did, they had to deal with these new life forms. So what the plants did is they developed a strategy. Some plants said, look, what we're going to do is we're going to get the animals to help us to spread our progeny, to help us reproduce ourselves and put ourselves all over the planet. And what we'll do is we'll make our fruit, you know, the fruit is where the seeds are held, right? That's where the babies are held. We'll make our fruit sweet and we'll make the seeds hard so that they can stand the trip through their animal's gastrointestinal tract. So that when that animal finally finds somewhere he wants to dump, 
he'll dump those seeds with his feces, and that feces will serve as fertilizer for our new babies. Genius, right? Okay. So we'll even let the animal know when it's time to eat us because we'll change our color from green to yet red, yellow, orange. That'll let him know it's time because you know all animals that eat fruit have color vision. Did you know that? All animals that eat fruit have color vision so they can know when the fruit is white by the color changes. So anyway, that was one strategy. The other strategy was some plants said, well, we don't want animals eating us. We don't want to be eaten. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to figure out a way to make up this chemical that'll make the animals that eat us sick. Wow, make them sick. Okay, so what they did was they made these chemicals called lectins. Lectins are proteins that have an adverse effect on the GI tract of the animals that eat them. Small animals that eat them get stomach aches and disoriented and some just go ahead and die. Large animals don't get so bad so they, they figured out a way to kind of tough through it because they like you know, eating the food. It's a taste buzz. But the primary problem that animals that eat these foods that are high in lectins get is tooth decay. Interesting, isn't it? How do they get tooth decay? They disrupt the hormonal system. How do they disrupt the whole hormonal system? They feed the bad bacteria. Make the bad bacteria harder to be overcome by the good bacteria. Wow. So, so if I eat foods that are high in lectins, I'm helping my bad bacteria beat up my good bacteria. So I have stomach problems, right? I have stuff like acid reflux, uh, stomach ulcers, uh, Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome. Wow, all that, just from eating them things, huh? So that's how this whole thing works. Remember back to the good bacteria, bad bacteria? Now, this is what I just talked about. Uh, oh, this is very important. With respect to fruit, this is really genius. Fruits are sweet, right? I mean, not, not, let me qualify that. Not all fruits are sweet. Some fruits are sweet, okay? The fruits, the plants that want to be eaten made their fruit sweet, okay? Now, in order to make sure that you would keep eating their fruit, they didn't make their, their sugar out of glucose. Glucose is the main sugar that we eat when we eat food. You know, we, we eat for glucose. You heard of glucose before. Glucose tolerance tests and the like. What plants did is they said, wait a minute. We're going to make a sugar called fructose. And the fructose will keep the animal eating because unlike glucose, glucose will make the blood sugar rise, which will make the insulin rise, which will make the leptin rise, which is a hormone that gives you a feeling of satisfied, and it'll make you stop eating, so it decreases your hunger. Fructose said, nah, we ain't going to do that. We're going to make fructose, we're going to bypass all the insulin thing, and we're going to skip that leptin thing, so that the animal that eats us don't get satisfied, and he'll keep on eating, and keep on eating, and keep on eating. So that's why sweet fruit is something you have to be very wary of. Very little, treat sweet fruit like candy. I don't make a meal of it. I know y'all love watermelon. I love it too. Don't make a meal of it. It's too much. Matter of fact, the ones they make now don't have no seeds anyway. I don't know what they, you know. Uh, let me see. Let me make sure I've got all the things. Okay, next. Remember, it's all about the plant's babies. Some plants want their babies to be eaten. Some plants don't want their babies to be eaten. So fortunately, we come back to lectins. And what are lectins? Again, Proteins that the plant made that it, so it, the animal that eats them will be sick. Now I'm going to mention some major categories of lectins. It's going to be kind of surprising and discomfort to a lot of people. I know it was discomforting for me too because I love all these things too. But um, since I gave them up, life is better. The first one we're going to talk about is grains. I know what grains are, right? Corn, rice, oats, barley, wheat, those are grains. Uh, breakfast cereals. How I many of y'all grew up in breakfast cereal like me? Oatmeal, supposed to lower your cholesterol, right? 
all those grains are loaded with lectins. Remember, lectins job is to feed your bad bacteria to make you ill. You gotta stop that. Now I know you say, well, what else is there to eat, doc? I mean, breakfast. <laughs> gotta have, gotta have, gotta have. That, that. And think, think about it. People say breakfast is the most important meal, right? Name the top five things people eat for breakfast, and most of them are going to be grains. Cereal, oatmeal, pancakes, donuts, toast. And then we wonder why we're sick, right? Now, so grains is number one. Go ahead. Those are grains. Corn, uh, millet. Now, uh, this one I did for you. I didn't even heard of that one. That's a grain in the Asia. Uh, now, cold season, cool season grain, barley, oats, rye, wheat, rice. Next. Pseudo grains. This is interesting. Buckwheat, chia, quinoa. No, everybody's eating quinoa now, right? Trying to be cool. That's what you're quinoa, pseudo grain, lectins. You want to stay away from that too. Next. Now, here's the toughie. This is the toughie now. I know this tough, right? Now, I had an aunt that had bad rheumatoid arthritis once, real bad, back in the 70s when I was in medical school. And she was crippled. And when I came home from school one time to visit my family, I went by to see her. And she was completely cured. I said, wow, Aunt Naomi, what you do? She said, I got off of nightshades. I said, nightshades? Why would nightshades make you sick? So I kept that in the back of my mind. And when I read this book, it said, OK, now I get it. The nightshades are tomatoes, white potatoes, I underline white, but not sweet potatoes, white potatoes, eggplants, and bell peppers, loaded with lectins. Now, tomatoes you actually can eat if you get rid of the seeds in the skin, because that's where the plant loaded up the lectins. But, you know, that's how it is. Uh, oh, you know what I didn't put up there? I forgot. My fault. Let me mention it. Legumes, that's the fourth one. It's grains, pseudograins, nightshades, and legumes. Let me tell you about legumes. Legumes are beans, peanuts, and cashews. I know, hey, I got it. I love, I love peanuts too. And for men, peanuts are bad for your prostate, so y'all gonna have an easy time giving up uh, peanuts. Okay? No peanuts. Cashews, they're beans, they're not nuts. So, just so it's clear, because I know the first question is gonna be, Doc, what nuts? Almonds. Pecans, walnuts, you know what I mean? Those are nuts. You can have them. Help yourself. But peanuts and cashews are not nuts. They're beans. Beans are loaded with lectins. Lectins feed your bad bacteria and make you sick. This basically is a slide showing you good bacteria and bad bacteria and that your job from now on is to focus on feeding your good bacteria and not overpowering them with your bad bacteria getting too much nutrition. Perfect. This is where I wanted to end it up. This is David Deary. This book was brought to me by a patient of mine about 25 years ago in my Allentown office. She said, Doc, I'm a breast cancer, breast cancer survivor. I've heard about the work you do. I'm very excited about it and proud of it, and I think you ought to have this book. So she gave me the book, wrote her name and number in there, Ms. Shatner, and I got the book and started reading it. Now, this guy, of course, he got in trouble, too, for writing the book. Remember I told you about Dr. Carter, about all the doctors who do this stuff, and they get in trouble? He got in trouble, too. He's a Canadian doctor. But when he wrote that, the guy said, man, you can't tell people that stuff. What I'm telling you now goes into the breast cancer piece. Because, of course, women, men, too, get breast cancer, you know. Chef got breast cancer, remember? Men get breast cancer, too. But women, of course, overwhelmingly. Why? Multifactorial again. Women have the most uh, symphony-like hormonal system there is. You, I don't know if you guys know that, but let me explain to you if you don't. We all have hormones. We all have the same hormones. Men got estrogen and women got testosterone. But the way their hormones work is a whole lot different from the way our hormones work because everything got to change cyclically. And you know how a symphony goes, when something don't work like it's supposed to work, at the time it's supposed to work, things ain't right, right? Okay, the breasts have to change, the uterus has to change. The whole purpose, remember I told you early on in the slide that the whole purpose is to reproduce. Every time a woman goes through a cycle, she's trying to get ready to reproduce a baby. That's what the body's doing, okay, to get her ready. So the breasts have to change, all these things have to change. 
the uterus, uh, the, the cycle starts with the, when the woman has a period, the first 14 days of the cycle, uh, the first five days she's bleeding for three to five days, but the lining of her uterus is being built up with estrogen, being built up to get ready for a pregnancy. And then day 14, and the estrogen is keeping the lining of the pregnancy in place so that uh, things will be ready for a new fertilized egg to come and latch in and bury itself into the lining of the uterus. At day 14, uh, the uh, ovary releases its egg. Day 14, that's ovulation. What's left is a structure called the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum will produce progesterone. You've heard of progesterone before, right? Okay, what does progesterone mean? Promotion of gestation. What's gestation? Pregnancy. Promotion of pregnancy. Real easy now, right? Progesterone promotes just So what that corpus luteum does is keeps that lining of the uterus intact so that egg can make its way down the fallopian tube to meet with a nice little sperm, and they get together, and they make that one, egg, that one cell that we all started with and embed into the, the lining of the uterus that was maintained there by the progesterone and we start out as a pregnant. That's what the whole process is about. Now, the fact that it doesn't happen every month, that's just something that happens. But that's the design is for it to happen every month, believe it or not, okay? That's the deal. So what David Deary, what David Deary is saying, look, is there. The number one thing that women lack in their disease processes is iodine. Iodine is the issue. How many of you ever heard of fibrocystic breast disease? Only a few, huh? Okay, fibrocystic breast disease is the most common disorder, disorder of female breasts. Very tender, very annoying, okay? It causes swelling, inflammation. Basically, fibrocystic breast disease is a deficiency of iodine, okay? And here's the way it works in a nutshell before we go to question and answer. We all have a thyroid gland, or we should. The thyroid gland controls how our cells burn sugars and fats. Remember there are three foods? Fats, sugars, and proteins. Okay, the body gets sugars and fats to burn for energy. Protein is used for building things. So when the body gets these sugars and fats, in, in order to burn them efficiently, it needs thyroid hormone from the thyroid, thyroid gland. Thyroid molecule has four iodine atoms on it, four. That's why you have to have iodine. You've heard of goiter? Heard of goiter in the large thyroid? Yeah? That comes from not having enough iodine. Okay. So if the thyroid produces this thyroxin, which is the thyroid hormone with four iodines on it, and it makes all of the cells able to function and burn sugars and fats, what do you get from burning things? Heat. That's why you have a body temperature. When you take your temperature, your temperature should be somewhere between 98 and 99 if you've got good functioning thyroid. If you take your temperatures and you're consistently below 90, 98, say 96, 97, your thyroid is not working well. Just shook a gentleman's hand a little while ago. His hand is ice cold. He's got low thyroid. He doesn't know it because we didn't do an office visit here today. But he has low thyroid. So if you want to check that, take your temperature 9, 12, and 3 for, for five days. 9 in the morning, 12 noon, 3 in the afternoon for five days. Average your temperatures. If you're consistently not getting up to 98, you've got low thyroid. Now, because the thyroid is so critical to your whole well-being, the thyroid has a... Uh, what do you call it? It has first dibs on all the iodine. So if you're in an area where there isn't a lot of iodine, like America, then you're going to not get enough iodine unless you make a point to get some iodine in your system. Now, the Japanese have the highest iodine intake because they eat a lot of seaweed and a lot of seafood. And they have the lowest cancer rates. Did you know that? Lowest cancer rates, highest iodine intake. America, low iodine intake, high cancer rates. Interesting, isn't it? Well, here's the deal. When you get the little bit of iodine you do get in your diet, and you know Morton's iodine salt was the first, the, the iodine was the first uh, mineral known to be deficiency in the diet of America. That's why they put iodine in the salt, Morton's iodine salt. But of course, people aren't eating much salt today because they're scared of high blood pressure, right? So that's not happening anymore. So people are getting low iodine. That's the deal. So anyway, the, if the... Um, body is deficient in iodine, it's like a pregnant woman. A pregnant woman has to eat for two. If she only eats for one, who gets the food? The baby. That's right. So she got to eat for two. Well, if you got a thyroid and you don't have enough iodine, guess who gets the iodine? The thyroid. Whatever little iodine you got, the thyroid gets it. 
So all of the rest of the body and every tissue, every cell, every body fluid has iodine in order for you to be healthy. So your, your thyroid gland will suck up all available iodine. The rest of the body will be deficient. And remember I told you about apoptosis, programmed cell death? Iodine is necessary for apoptosis to occur. Guess what cancer cells don't have enough of? Iodine. So they don't know when it's time to die. Okay, so if the thyroid gland sucks up all available iodine, the rest of the body doesn't have enough iodine, the rest of the body's prone to get every, everything, including cancer. Think about this, and I'm just about, I know, yo, we just, I'm just about there. Here's the deal. Think about the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland needs more iodine than any other tissue in the body per unit weight. So if you could take a, 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 a quarter pound of thyroid and a quarter pound of any other tissue in the body, the thyroid would need more iodine than any other tissue. But guess what needs more iodine by volume based upon the size of its, its structure? The breast. The breast need more iodine than thyroid. So if the iodine is sucking up all available iodine, guess what's happening to the breast? You're not getting enough. So they're going to get what? Cysts, lumps, fibrocystic, and breast cancer. That's what breast cancer is. Fibrocystic breast disease is just a precursor to breast cancer. Same thing happens to the, to the thyroid. Guess what? If the thyroid gets nodules, cysts, goiter, hypothyroid, hyperthyroid, all signs of low, low iodine. So what my man said here is basically iodine is the whole thing. And what's he say here? The least understood most important element making of body fluids has been neglected since most research funds did not uh, uncover any function of iodine other than disinfectant. Most of you old enough to remember uh, the different uh, disinfectants people put on their skin to kill infection. Uh, betadine and, and the like. Okay, but again, iodine is a mineral. You can't patent it. That goes back to uh, Dr. Carter. Dr. Carter said, look, medicine is a business, and the biggest business in medicine is drugs. The reason why drugs is a big business is because the drug companies own those drugs. You can't copy those drugs as long as they're on patent, but you can't patent a natural substance. So if a natural substance does you good, the drug companies aren't interested in it because they can't own it. You can't own iodine. So that's the, the essence of this whole thing. Um, of course, it found the highest amounts in seaweed. Uh, let's see. Yeah. OK, these are just, I listed these. I'm not going to read all of them for you. But these are just the number of proposed functions of iodine in the body. And the, the main one I wanted to point out is, oh, this is another thing. You do know that if a woman doesn't have, before conception, enough iodine in her body, then she can have the, uh, a high likelihood of developing a child that has uh, mental dysfunction. You've heard of cretinism, right? Cretinism is an iodine deficiency in the woman before she conceives. So it's important that women take iodine. That's one of the things I wanted to make clear on this. And I think we're just to see. We talked about fibrocystic breast disease. Uh, three grams of iodine a day is necessary for the thyroid to get saturated. You need more than three grams, or the three, three milligrams, I'm sorry. Uh, the Japanese get somewhere between eight to 10 milligrams a day, and they don't have these problems. I give my patients 12 milligrams a day, and I take one myself, 12 milligram tablet. And that's the tablet that I use. Now, why do I use that one? Lugol, John Lugol, developed a sub solution called Lugol solution because he found out that iodine was better uh, uh, mixed in solution with potassium, so it's potassium iodide. But it's very messy, it stains things, and you know. So uh, some people came together and they put together the same thing in a tablet. And each tablet is 12.5 milligrams, and that's what I use. Uh, last thing I'll say before I finish this is interesting. Uh, just about everybody in here has either had a thyroid problem or is going to have a thyroid problem or has a thyroid problem. That's how common it is, okay? Uh, low thyroid is the most common thyroid disorder, underactive thyroid, or the thyroid not producing enough thyroxine. Okay. Um, there's an expert in this whole field that I listened to back the, two days before Michael Jackson died. I got a chance to hear his lecture. And he says something very interesting. He said, if a person has underactive thyroid, they need iodine. If they have overactive thyroid, they need more. Think about that. That's interesting, isn't it? 
If you have underactive thyroid, you need iodine. If your thyroid is overactive, you need more. Counterintuitive, isn't it? I went home, you know how they say, if you build it, they will come? As Soon as I got back to the office, patient came in, overactive the thyroid. I said, okay, I'm gonna give her four tablets of iodine. See what happens. Because that's what he said do. Cleared her up right away. It's absolutely a miracle. So bottom line is, this iodine thing is, is very, very, very important. If you don't know anything else from this lecture, remember, I gotta take some iodine, okay? And one of the things, I'll, the last thing I'll say before we open it for questions is this. There's a doctor named Brother Barnes who died uh, back in the 80s, but he wrote a book called Hypothyroidism, The Unsuspected Illness. And uh, we talked a little bit about thyroid, but his whole thing was about thyroid. And the reason why most people who have thyroid disease don't get diagnosed is because doctors rely on the blood test. They'll say, we want a TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, we want a T4 and a T3. Well, they're almost always normal, even if you have a low thyroid, almost always. So what Brother Barnes found is that, well, the best way to find out is take the temperature. Why? Remember we said before, if your thyroid's job is to control how your cells burn sugars and fats, and you have 70 to 100 trillion cells burning sugars and fats, collectively they're gonna make a temperature, right? Then you ever wonder how when you take your temperature, you got 98 something? That's pretty hot. If I said, you know, when y'all go outside, it's gonna be 98.6 degrees outside. Y'all know it's gonna be pretty hot in. Well, how did you get your, you know outside came from the sun. How did you get your temperature? You got it from all them cells, you got burning sugars and fats. So if your cells are burning per properly, you should have a temperature above 98. So if your thyroid is working and you're bur burning effectively, you'll have a high temperature. But if your, th if your thyroid is not, then it'll be lower, okay? So that's the essence of the whole thing. So what Brother Barnes found was that that's what he should do. Find out if a person got low body temperature and treat them with natural thyroid to make them better. At the end of his career, he decided to do a retrospective study. 35 years of work. He went back to see what happened to the patients who had been diagnosed with low thyroid based on his body temperature, not the blood test, and then placed on natural thyroid. Very interesting. Those people never got heart disease. Isn't that interesting? What do they say is the number one kill in this country? Heart disease, okay? Jeremy Caslow was the MD that I had dinner, uh, lunch, uh, my breakfast with a few years ago. He was in town giving a lecture at Harrisburg. I went to hear his lecture. And he worked with Brother Barnes, and I said, Jeremy, um, Brother Barnes said that if you uh, got low thyroid and you take it, you don't get heart disease. He said, uh, if you take iodine, you don't get cancer either. Hope you guys enjoyed the talk. Any questions, you open them up, I'll talk to you. Okay, how are you going to do the mic thing? Look, yo, yo, wherever you put the mic to, I'm doing. So we get to that. For uh, iodine, if you yes. don't have thyroids, um, if you don't have a thyroid, yes, okay, you had a thyroidectomy, yes, so you so, either had cancer or overactive thyroid, and that's how they treated you, yes, right, I had okay, cancer, right, so you still have to take iodine, okay, okay? I take synthroid, you so, take synthroid, that's yes. synthetic, that's synthetic uh, uh, thyroid, mm -hmm. that's synthetic thyroid, though, you still need iodine, okay, okay. how are your temperatures even with that synthroid? How your temperature's good? You ever take them? Most people don't take them unless they got a fever. Take your temperature and see what they are. If your temperature's, look, if you take a temperature 9, 12, and 3 for five days and they're looking good, your synthroid's working. If it's not, then your synthroid's not working. You need to do something that's a little different. Probably nature throw it. Well, that has happened just recently. It wasn't working. So yeah. I'm in the process of getting it to Oh, work. you got to switch over. Now, your endocrinologist ain't going to deal with that. He don't understand it. He's not trained to think like that. So he don't think like that. So you got to get somebody who can do that for you. Okay. okay? Why is it so hard to get functional tests? Why does somebody get what kind of test? Why is it so hard when you go to the doctor that they won't give you functional tests? Functional tests. Give me an example what you mean by functional tests. Um, your liver. Liver? Yes. Oh, liver so function? Right. Oh, that's, that's standard. That's uh, AST, ALT, alkphosphatase. Those are they're standard. That's a standard chemistry. If you do any standard chemistry, you get liver tests on there. You'll get that. Oh, okay. Yeah, don't worry about that. That's easy. Oh, they can't hear you. They can't. She, she was diagnosed with breast cancer four or five years ago. She had a lumpectomy. Go ahead. 
got more lymph nodes. That you got lymph nodes, yeah. And the doctor has put me on high doses of estrogen and said I would have to be on that for five more years. Right. But it gives me so many side effects like right. aching and it just... Now, let me tell you why they should not put you on estrogen. Estrogen, remember, remember we said what's the main job of estrogen? is to increase the lining of your uterus to get ready for pregnancy, right? So it makes things grow. You don't want things to grow after you're an adult, you know what I mean? So you don't want to take, maybe you, which they should have given you is progesterone. See, let me tell you, there's, see, let me tell you why that makes sense. Women are their healthiest when they're pregnant. I know they don't feel good all the time, but you're at, the, the, the creator designed it so that you're going to be the healthiest you're going to be when you're pregnant. And your, your, the hormone is highest when you're pregnant is progesterone because it's promoting gestation. Well, is there any progesterone in meloxicam and, and the uh, estras, uh, nastrozol? Wait, wait, the, you said progesterone melo and meloxicam? What about meloxicam? Is there any progesterone in the meloxicam? Oh, or? They could be what they mix, but progesterone is by itself. They could mix it with something else, but I, I don't suggest that. Progesterone by itself. Now, if you've got breast cancer, you need to be, do progesterone, but what the main thing you want to do is make sure your thyroid is working and you're taking iodine if you want to not get it again. All right. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Very informative uh, lecture. I'd like you to know, can you take kelp instead? Kelp. And if so, how much? Well, that's the whole deal. You, you, taking kelp is good, no, because kelp is one of the most well-known seaweeds, and it's loaded with iodine. How to measure it to make sure you get the right doses, I can't necessarily say, but certainly it's not a bad thing. That's why I use the outer because I know exactly what the measure is. That's all. But Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yes, I like to know autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. They have me on mexotrexate, and I'm trying my best to get off of that stuff. Yeah, poison. But um, they told me about um, autoimmune disease, and I'm on mexotrexate once a week, six tablets once a week. And I want to get off of that, along with diabetes. Question. You have any root canals? Yes. When did you have them put in? Before or after the uh, onset of your root? Before. Rheumatoid? Now I got you. Now you see what I'm saying? Bottom line is this. What you got to do is you have to treat. See, that's an infection you have. See, if you look at the books on rheumatoid, they'll say etiology. Etiology means the cause. Cause unknown. What's the price published in 1923? It's caused by infection from the teeth. So you got to treat the infection. That's how you get rid of it. All right? Thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead, go ahead. Dr. Lecter, good day. Thank you for coming. Sure, you're welcome. Um, I have a sensitivity to salt. And you mean the, table salt? Uh, salt in any kind of things. Okay. Uh, it just hit my stomach and it makes it just feel repulsive. Okay. So would the iodine sensitivity be the reason that happened? No, no, no. Matter of fact, if any, anytime, first of all, I didn't talk about this in the conversation, but anytime a person has a GI sensitivity, the first thing I want them to do is treat for parasites. After that, then see if you still had a problem. And then follow the concept of reducing the lectins in your diet. You should see all GI problems straight out. Which I was following uh, Dr. Gundry's stuff. Exactly. Oh, yeah, read that. I was, I was reading the other book he had. Right. The, the other one. He had one before this, right? Yes. Yeah. This is his latest book, right? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. My mother just recently passed from metastatic colon cancer. Wait, say, did you start again? Uh, my mother just passed away from metastatic colon cancer. Right. And I wanted to know, is there any benefit to immunotherapy? Because it seemed she became worse, started to have like renal problems, liver problems once she began the immunotherapy. Uh, I don't know if I understood the whole question. Your mother has metastatic cancer. Correct, yes, the colon. From colon? Yes. And your question is, what should... Is there any benefit to immunotherapy versus chemotherapy? Well, here's the problem. In, in, in medicine, remember, medicine is a business. There's three treatments for cancer in medicine, chemo, radiation, and surgery. In fact, in California, if somebody suggests, a physician suggests anything other than those three, it's a felony. It's business. 
So what can you do about metastatic cancer outside of what they're suggesting? You got to look for, now see, understand, I don't see there's a reason why a person can't undergo certain things that for conventional doctors and do some alternative things. First of all, everybody should be eating good. I don't care what treatment plan you suggest. Got to get the eating thing right and everybody should be taking iodine. Now the doctors don't necessarily know you should be taking iodine, but you need to take it anyway. And I, the words of warning, all doctors are gonna prohibit you from taking any nutritional supplement. They think it's, it'll kill you. It's gonna cause you to bleed to death. It's not good for you. Don't believe that, okay? They mean well, they're just part of their training. They don't know. So there's certain basic things you have to take, vitamin D, uh, iodine, essential fats and minerals because that was the other thing that I wanted to point out with respect to the lecture with uh, uh, Dr. Otto Warburg. To make the cell membranes healthy, you have to get adequate essential fats and, mi and, and uh, minerals. And the essential fats are found primarily in uh, flax, coconut oil, uh, evening primrose oil, those kinds of things. Hello, Dr. Burton. Um, Hello. Cardiology. Now, Cardiolo after having um, triple heart bypass. You had a triple heart bypass? Right. Okay. Is it possible that I can become back to normal sure. without getting out of breath, like after walking a mile? Interestingly enough, Dr. Gundry is a cardiovascular surgeon who got started on this nutrition thing because he found out he can reverse heart disease with nutrition, and he stopped doing surgery. Okay, where is he located? Where is he? Yeah. Oh, he's in California. I think Loma Linda. And he was in Loma Linda. He's out in California, though. Oh, okay. But, but, but the, the basic thing is follow the diet. That, and the only other thing you need to know about is chelation therapy. We don't talk about, okay, we don't talk about that. Okay, because I always get out of breath. Pardon me? I always get out of breath. Uh, if I walk, I Yeah, have yeah, yeah. You ever heard of chelation therapy? I'm sorry? Chelation therapy? No. You need to look chelation therapy up. Okay. That and Gunji's diet, you should be good. Do you do that? Do you... Do that? Oh, absolutely. I've been doing it for okay. 30 years. All right. You take Blue Cross Blue Shield? <laughs> well, we can talk about it. <laughs> we can talk about it. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello, yes. Um, I have a problem with uh, thyroid, and I have hypo. You have, you have hypothyroid? Yes. And, uh, yeah. they easy, did, easy. They did steroids on one of them took one side out. Well, I didn't understand what they had surgery on it to have her back. Oh, they took, you, you had your thyroid removed? Yes, one. Oh, so you, gotta take, you have to take thyroid. You're on Synthroid too? Yes. Yeah, that's the standard medicine. When I was in medical school, we were taught Synthroid. We didn't know anything else. Then I got out of medical school, and I was giving people Synthroid, and they weren't getting better. And then in 1988, a patient came to my office in downtown. An older man came in and said, Dr. Burton, I got low thyroid. I said, low thyroid? You did the blood test? He said, Doc, the blood test is worthless. I did the Broder Barnes test. I took my temperatures. I said, oh. So I go home and read Broder Barnes' book. Everybody I'm seeing got Broder Barnes things. So I started taking their temperatures and putting them on thyroid, and they started snapping out of it. You got to take thyroid, but you got not Synthroid. If Synthroid is not working for you, and it can work in about 5%, 10% of the cases, but if it's not working, you got to take a natural thyroid. I take, um, I take one every day. You take what? I take... Uh, but, um, I take a Central. period every morning, every day. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. If it's working for you, I don't, just don't stop. But if it ain't working, you got to take something else. Don't seem like it's working. I, don't know. I really don't seem like it's working. He told me I might pick my weight back up. You, wait, but, you're saying to me, how do you know if it's working? What do you I say? mean, don't seem like it might not be working like it should. You know, I don't feel like sometimes, um, I might feel in, out of energy or tired sometimes. Like that, but when you take that medicine, it's supposed to help boost you up, help build your thyroid up. Did you understand what she said? What did she say? She said, okay, that's when I take, when I take my medicine. When you take thyroid? Yes, one a day. What happens when you take thyroid? Thyroid, well, Does it make you feel good? No. Then stop. <laughs> You're simple. Who's that? That's what you need. That's what you need to do. Stop that and get, and you can check, find out what you really need. You ain't taking the right stuff. Uh, oh, you can that. if you want. You can, but he ain't gonna tell you what to take. He's gonna tell you to take more. I don't. Uh, I don't want to go back to him. Pardon me? <laughs> no, nah, bring no problems. Go ahead. Who's next? See, you have to understand, your doctor hasn't been trained this way. And all, the only reason I know this is because I got out of medical school in 1981. 
And then I went to residency, and I got out of residency in 1984. And then I hit the road and started finding doctors that really know how to help people. Because I had seen doctors in the military, I had seen doctors at St. Joe's Hospital here in North Philly, where I was an orderly at work. I seen doctors in medical school, and doctors in residency. They weren't doing it. I had seen enough. I want to find guys that really know how to help people. And I found them. And those are the guys I just showed you. You ain't going to hear about that. Good afternoon, doctor. Good afternoon. Thanks for the seminar. I have breast cancer. Okay. I had surgery in April, and now post-surgery treatment, I have two rounds of ke uh, chemotherapy. Right. I've taken that already. I have two more rounds to go. Right. I have five weeks of radio uh, radiation therapy. Radiation therapy. Right. That's on the schedule. Now. I had, uh, originally I had a question. My PCP suggested that I take two herbs, Which moringa ones? and soursop. Okay. Uh, do you know anything about that? I know something about them, but... Yeah, is it good? And, and, and I'm not saying you should take them. I don't need problem with herbs. Along with your iodine, you take that. Okay, my other question... And make sure your thyroid's working. All right. If your so thyroid's not working and you're not taking iodine, it doesn't make no difference. All right. No, they got to work. The iodine. So yeah. I, I should go back to my endocrinologist, I guess. No, you should go to your drugstore and get you a thermometer and then do what I just told you. Because he's not going to tell you. He doesn't know that. Um, look, I, look, I, look, I know that this, this is hard for people to conceptualize. Doctors are taught temperature is bad if it's high. If it's low, it's okay. I say it's bad if it's, so, if it's low. They're not going to tell you that. They're going to tell you. Go tell him what I told you, see what he says. He's going to tell you I'm crazy. You have to take this into your own hands. You can't rely on your endocrinologist. He doesn't know. Mm, okay. And he thinks that if he thinks outside the box, somebody will hurt him, so he won't look out there. All right. My other question is, one of the side effects is the taste in my mouth. Does that have of anything? what? Like a metal taste or From a bitter what, taste? Though? You said you have a... Anything I eat. Anything you eat. Or eat or drink. I just cause you're not, that's because you're not in balance. That's why things that you should be tasting, that should taste good, don't taste good because you're out of balance. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I get in balance by... By doing those things. Like first get your... Th See, your hormones are not right. That's why you got breast cancer in the first place. So, and many times because you didn't have enough iodine. You understand? Oh, okay. Get, get on track with that and the thyroid. And that, that'll... That whole book I just showed you, breast cancer and iodine, he says it's thyroid and iodine. The breast cancer is all about not having enough thyroid and not having iodine. That's what threw your hormonal system off. And the thyroid is the key hormone, the key. Every cell in the body needs thyroid. Let me give you an instance. Let's say you have a pancreas cell. The pancreas cell makes insulin. Let's say that the pancreas cells don't have enough thyroid, so they can't, thyroid, so they can't make enough insulin. What are you going to get now? Diabetes. But what was the real problem? You had enough thyroid. You understand what I'm saying? Thyroid is the key. All right. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Greetings, doctor. Uh, I have a enlarged prostate, and I wanted to ask you. I heard you say something about lagoons, and uh, I was going to ask you how can I treat my enlarged prostate, and are garbanzo beans considered a lagoon? Or are they good for you? That's a good question. I think they're a part of the bean family. Now, here's the thing that's interesting. Let me qualify now. First of all, you've got to get off of peanuts, number one. Number two, lagoons can be consumed after you've gotten yourself cleaned up for about a couple, two or three months of doing the program, getting your, getting your balance of your good bacteria up on track again. You can eat legumes if you pressure cook them, because the pressure cooking will destroy the, le the, uh, the lectins. Are you, are you familiar with um, MMS or the mineral? M M mineral? M yeah, um, uh, yeah. Okay, and also vitamin B17. Vitamin B, that's layer trip. Which is, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, are those very effective in the cure of cancer? Do, no. Can, no? No, not especially 17. I tried it. Not that effective. You said vitamin B17, right? Vitamin B17, okay. layer trip. Oh. Uh, uh, apricot pits? Mm hmm No. And Tried it. Don't work. Never saw a person get better with it. I never saw a person get better with it. Now, I'm not saying somebody somewhere in the world didn't see somebody get better. I tried it on several cancer patients back in the, the 90s. Didn't see it work. 
and the MMS is a no-no as well? Eh, I'm, I'm, it's, it's a mineral supplement. Again, there are lots of mineral supplements, and minerals are key. So it, it, it's not going to hurt you. But I'm just saying as far as Laetrile or B17, don't count on it. Mm. And also, um, you mentioned uh, some foods and some foods that we're not supposed to be eating, but what should we High lectin foods, high lectin foods, grains, pseudo grains, uh, legumes, and nightshades. Those are the foods you want to watch out for. Okay. Those foods are made from plants that don't want you to eat them. And because of that, they made lectins and lectins are poisons to you. That's basically it. Right. Good afternoon, Doctor. Good afternoon. How you First, doing? I want to say uh, the sound in here is not very good, so most of the time we can't hear you. We've got a strain to hear you. Oh, so okay. if you can speak up, that would be helpful. You want me to speak up or speak down? Speak up. Okay. okay. Uh, I was second, told to speak down. I, okay. okay, go ahead. Uh, I want to say, we explain to the audience how important uh, essential vitamins and nutrients are to your health, how important the pH is to your health. Um, could you cover that? Because I haven't heard anybody mention that at all. And uh, the percentage of oxygen that determines if you have cancer, because at a certain level of oxygen uh, indicates cancer. Yeah, well, essentially, cancer is a low oxygen situation. What level of low oxygen is kind of, I, I don't know a measure for that, but I do know that uh, the whole idea that the, uh, Otto Warburg came up with was that if the cells are not getting enough oxygen, they're going to revert to another way of getting energy and that's going to be cancer. Uh, as far as pH is concerned, uh, every area of the body has its own natural level of pH. And what I have found is that if the body is getting all of the tissue, all of the minerals and essential fats and vitamins that it needs, which it can get through uh, most of the things I'm, well, I didn't say this. Uh, people say, well, Doc, if you can't eat legumes, you can't eat nightshades, you can't eat grains or pseudograms, what can I eat? You can eat meat, good quality, assuming, uh, seafood, fowl, fowl is birds, eggs, fruits, as long as they're not, you know, you uh, uh, watch out for the very sweet fruits, don't eat them like candy, and vegetables, as long as they're not high in lectins. Help yourself. That's basically, they'll give you, if you eat good quality of those, with organics, you'll get plenty of minerals, that it, along with mineral supplementation. That's the whole thing. You gotta have good mineral supplementation. All those will make the pH like it should be. Yeah. Dr. Greetings. Burton, uh, oh. God bless you and thank you for the knowledge. Um, I just wanted to know your thoughts on the late Dr. Sabi. Uh, with, with his uh, informal, he didn't have any formal training. So I just wanted to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, he, had, he, had, he had no formal training. Right. Third grade. Right, yeah. and so I wanted to know your thoughts on that, as well as the uh, moderation diet, like eating everything or taking things in moderation. Well, understand, um, as far as Sebi is concerned, I met Sebi in the, in the spring of 1982 in Washington, D.C. Uh, he was there at that time upset because Teddy Pendergrass wouldn't let him uh, work on him to get rid of his paralysis, as if he was going to do that. Uh, but anyway, Sebi, I... I I don't like to speak bad of the dead. What I'm going to say is this. A broke clock is right twice a day. Sebi said some things that made sense, but he said some things made no sense. And I kind of had to work with him right, that way. Yeah, who you got? Go ahead. Whoever. Hello. Uh, thank you for all this information today. It's really informative. You're welcome. Um, I am in remission from Hodgkin's. Good. And I obviously I want to stay cancer free and I was wondering what I know taking iodine can help but what are some of the best things to do to um, not have the cancer recur. Also right. do you have any recommendations for pulmonary hypertension? Ooh, wow, pulmonary hypertension. Um, let me ask the first thing. First one first. Uh, the best thing a person can do to prevent a return, a recurrence of cancer is the same thing a person can do to prevent it from coming in the first place. Make sure your body has its, lots of essential fats and minerals, uh, vitamin D, because you know human beings are suffering from vitamin D deficiency big time. You gotta take vitamin D, take iodine and make sure your thyroid is working. See, that's the one thing most people are missing because again, you go to your regular doc, he does a routine thyroid study. The routine thyroid study is going to come back normal in most cases, even though you got low thyroid. 
So you can't go by that. You got to do your temperatures. Make sure your thyroid is working. Take iodine, essential fats, minerals, and vitamin D. You'll be good. So the um, hypertension, the pulmonary hypertension. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, pulmonary hypertension. Ugly disease. You know somebody has that? I hope not. Me. You. You have yeah. pulmonary hypertension? Yeah. Wow. From autoimmune disease. So. From what? From scleroderma. Oh, scler wait, scleroderma? Yeah, it's a symptom of scleroderma. So, wait a minute. You got root canals too? I had a root canal. Uh -huh. I had two. Yeah. yeah. Young. Okay. Okay. Uh, scleroderma is an uh, uh, autoimmune disease, so called. Yeah. Connective tissue disease, causal vascular disease, yeah. rheumatoid group lesion. You know that's what that is, right? Yeah. Okay, I have so lupus you have an infection. Overlap also. Pardon me? I have lupus overlap with that. You have an, a dental infection. That's what you have. You got to treat that infection. So you don't have several different diseases. You got one problem, you just haven't dealt with it. How do I deal with that? Oh, well, I can show you. I can't tell you right now. We got me out of town. Yeah. <laughs> Bottom line, I can tell you about that. But basically, you have an infection. Okay. Scleroderma. Yeah. Um, my wife won't mind me telling you. My wife has lupus, which okay. is a cousin of what you got. It's autoimmune yeah, yeah. disease. It's so called autoimmune. It's an infection. So, okay. The um, antibiotic protocol, you do that? Yeah. Have you, have you okay. seen the. Go to the road back foundation. Yeah, I have. Yeah. Oh, there you go. All right, you well, got it. That's brown stuff. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I just want to thank you for the lecture you gave. Um, for digestive issues, uh, herbalist suggested a plant-based diet for me. Um, plant-based, vegan. Plant-based. Oh, wait, vegan. Ho, ho, ho. You're a vegan? Yes. Don't. Not good. Now, now, look, I know, I know, hold on. I was a vegetarian for 23 years. You know why I gave it up? Why? My old vegetarians, meaning people who had been vegetarian the longest were coming out with cancer. That's why I came out looking for this, to find out what's the deal. Now, you, you heard me mention Weston Price, the guy who went around looking at everybody's teeth and you saw the pictures of the teeth, the ones who ate the foods of modern convenience versus the ones that didn't eat the foods of modern convenience. Right. He found that people who had the healthiest teeth had to eat animal. Matter of fact, he said the people who had the healthiest teeth on the planet in the 1920s and 30s were the Maori people in New Zealand. The diet was seafood and vegetables. Their cavity rate was one cavity per thousand teeth examined. Yeah, you got to eat some meat. You got to eat some animal. You don't have to eat a whole lot, but you got to eat some animal. I know, trust me, I got it, I know. Yeah, I know. You, know, you know, Dick Gregory, Dick Gregory was a fruitarian, and Dick Gregory came down with lymphoma. Dick Gregory was a fruitarian and came down with lymphoma. Can I discuss with you later? Oh, then? we can discuss it. I'm going to tell you the same thing, I'm but just, I was going to discuss no, it. I'm just, I mean, trust me, I'm, and I appreciate that. I got lots of patients. I have lots of patients that come to me who have vegan issues. And they want to be a vegan, and I got it for whatever reason. But if you want to be optimally healthy, it's going to be real hard because you weren't designed to be on the planet and not eat animals. I mean, I know, yeah, I know, trust me, I know. Well, can I just talk to you more about suggestions, I guess? Suggestions? Any for, suggestions for what? For just moving forward, just talk to you more about oh, that. Oh, we, we have to sit down and talk, and okay. hold hands and pray. <laughs> no. <laughs> Readings, Dr. Burton. Yes. Uh, I was diagnosed with um, lesions of cysts on my kidneys. Okay. And the doctor was unsure if on the right kidney was cancerous. Okay. I don't want to wait until he's sure or not. So how, how, how long ago was this? A year and a half ago. Okay, good. That means the longer it's been, the less chance it's cancer. First of all, remember this. I'm glad you brought that up. Cysts are iodine deficiencies, no matter where they exist. Okay? You want some iodine. Thank you, sir. Yeah. She's like an old patient of mine right there. Give her a <laughs> Who's next? Who's next? Get this lady. This lady right here. Okay. Yes. Thank you for being here, doctor. Um, one question was already answered for me. It was about the layer trail. Right, layer because trail. I've been, I was um, doing some research on that because one of my um, yeah, a don't waste your time, told me about please. It. Okay, so the layer trail is, is no good. What about alkaline water? Is that good for a person? Oh no, alkaline cancer? water. No, alkalinity is is good, and I think alkaline water is good also. Uh, it's, it's another thing, mm -hmm. not a cure all, but it's another thing to help out. Right. What yeah. about um, what about cancer being um, 
uh, vitamin C deficiency. Is that true? Because I know I've had cancer and, I've, and I'm right now I'm in stage four breast cancer. And I've had it for like three years now, but I've been taking vitamins and, and doing herbs and changed my diet. And so far my oncologist is, is trying to tell me that I need to keep getting radiation scans so they can check this and check this, but I keep on de declining it because I was told that radiation yeah. is bad for you. And I've had that already and chemotherapy. So yeah. I stay away from right. all now, of that right now. now. Vitamin C is important, especially as an anti-infective agent. But people who have deficiency in vitamin C also have deficiency in other, vi other vitamins and minerals. So it's hard to isolate out vitamin C being the culprit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead. Got it? Go ahead, try it again. Can I know something? Did you turn it off? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. I would like to know, do I have to continue taking my thyroid medicine along with the iodine? Longer than iodine? Along with the oh, iodine. Oh, yeah. Uh, with, you, you taking thyroid now? Yes. What thyroid are you taking? Liparel, a lipsinil, liparel, lipinacil. Wait, lisinopril is blood pressure medicine. It's what? Lisinopril is blood pressure medicine. You're taking something for thyroid. It will say liothyronine or levothyroxine or something like that. What does it say? Yeah, it's something like synthroid. It's synthroid, Some right? Okay. Synthroid. Here's the deal. Synthroid, as I said earlier, if it's working for you, keep taking it. How if it how if it's not working for you, stop Don't taking it and get on something that's working. Iodine you need to take for the rest of your days. How often do I take my temperature? Oh, 9 in the morning, 12 noon, and 3 in the afternoon for 5 days. Oh, okay. And average out the temperature. In other words, at the end of the day, when you get ready to go to bed, it's 9 o'clock, you take a temperature, it says 98.2. You add the, the, the 9 o'clock temperature, I mean the 3 o'clock temperature, the 12 o'clock temperature, the 9 a.m. temperature, add them together, divide by 3. That gives you an average. If that temperature is not getting close to 98 or above, your thyroid is not working well. Or your, te or your thermometer is broke, something wrong. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. She's she, she been waiting patiently. Hi, Dr. Burton. Thank you for being here today and sharing all the information you shared with us. You are. Um, my question is, what is your treatment for uterine fibroids? Uterine fibroids? Mm -hmm. Really interesting question. Um, Believe it or not, there's a uh, uh, doctor who uh, promoted a therapy that I've been using called autoheme therapy. And an autoheme therapy, what you do basically is takes about 10 cc, five to 10 cc of blood out of the patient and inject it back into the hip. And that, along with diet, you do that once a week for about 10, 15 weeks, and that usually shrinks the fibroids. It's called autoheme therapy. Look it up, autoheme, uh, A-U-T-O-H-E-M-E, -A and uh, uh, there's a doctor from Portugal, Portugal who promoted it. It's really effective. Um, thank you for your information. Um, I was diagnosed with um, prostate cancer some years ago. I had radiation therapy three months of that, then after that came back again, I had hormone therapy, something I wouldn't advise to nobody, it was terrible. So then another year, two years later, the cancer came back again. It, uh, my ribs started feeling like somebody was stabbing me with a knife. I got to where I couldn't walk or stand up. Sometimes I have to crawl to the bathroom. So I went to the doctor, he said, well now you got stage four aggressive cancer. He said, I'm the type of Gleason, your Gleason is all this and that, and your PSA is in the hundreds. He said, look, the way it is, he said, I'm be honest, you maybe got three to six months to live. This was three years ago. Right. So I came home, right? And I told my pastor, he said, well, that's the truth. He said, you may have cancer, but the truth is here. He started with my spirituality part. And then fortunately, I started doing some study, and people came to me about Moringa, this vitamin C. I started doing this vitamin D thing. I started doing black seed, getting into herbs and everything. That was three years ago. I'm here today. That's so great. then about another year or two ago, he came back. He said, listen. It's as bad as it was before, and even worse. He said, I'm not going to tell you you only got three to six months to live this time. You do what you've been doing last time, and I'm going to do what I'm doing. But now it's coming back again, and he's telling me that 
There is no way. Right now, my ribs is cracked from the cancer. The cancer in my spines, my lip nose, outside my prostate. And they're telling me there is no cure for it. What I want to know is, what, can, can I cure it? I'm believing it can be cured. And what route should I take? Because I don't want to do the chemo anymore. Now, see, here's the thing, and I want to uh, point this out to the audience. When people say, I treated that cancer and the cancer came back. I treated it and it came back. No, it never went anywhere. <laughs> you got to change the conditions. That's like having a, a relative that won't leave. You think you put them out and you see them back the next day. You ain't really got rid of them yet. What you got to do is you got to change. See, can, you know, cancer is very interesting because, you know, I'm sure all of you have heard the sociological principle where if you take a boy out of a neighborhood and he's a bad kid in a bad neighborhood and you take him and reform, then you put him back in that same bad neighborhood, what's going to happen? You know what I mean? Ch likelihood is going to get back there again, right? Well, you got to change the environment that created the cancer. The cancer was created. Remember I told you now, Otto Warburg found that if the, if the cells can't get enough oxygen, they are going to revert the cancer. So they got to get, so in other words, in order for cells to get their adequate amount of oxygen, they have to have a healthy environment to live in. So, and the best way to supply that is with essential fats, minerals, vitamin D, you know, you got, you got to make sure there's a little, and all of the guys who really do, I mean, the big guys, Max Gerson, Gerson has a, had a clinic in Mexico, and everybody who came, they got 20 pounds of organic food a day in the form of juices. It's five or six coffee enemas every day. Uh, iodine. He, he gave you liquid iodine. Everybody, he's, Max Gerson said, if you were sick, you need the thyroid and iodine, period. If you had a sickness, you need thyroid and iodine. So are you taking thyroid, iodine, and all that sort of no, stuff? No, I have um, vitamin C, vitamin D. But not thyroid and iodine. But I, but I you can go vitamin it, everything you want. That, right? If you ain't taking thyroid and iodine, it ain't thyroid gonna work. Thyroid and iodine, okay, that's what you I got want to, to know. I'm telling you, you gotta do that. Those are the keys. Right. See, you understand now, I, tell, I had people come to my office and they had shopping bags of supplements. Shopping bags. And they say, Doc, which one should I take? I say, which one's working? Which one's working? Which can, how, how many vitamins can you afford? You can go to GNC and buy the whole store, you know. You know, because remember now, it's a business. They're going to sell everything they can. That's why I tell you, there's only a few things you really need to understand. You don't need to take all of that stuff. Is it nice? It's right. It's like, is it nice to put A1 sauce versus Heinz 57? It, it's up to you. But the real function is eat the food. Who's next? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, sir. How you doing? Good. How you doing? Uh, my question is, uh, the autoimmune disease, is that a result of the lack of iodine or an infection tooth? From what I heard from you. know, that's so very far. interesting because, you know, different people have different intake, in, different takes on autoimmune. Uh, David Deary felt that iodine was the basis of everything, lack of iodine. But here's the point you have to remember now. When you, the, the term autoimmune is kind of tricky, first of all. Because the term autoimmune it was developed to, to explain the concept that the body is attacking itself. Autoimmune, self-immune. So, you know, I don't accept that phrase other than for communication to make people understand what I'm talking about, but I don't believe the body is actually attacking itself. Here's what uh, Weston Price found when he published his work in 1923. He said, look, here's the deal. If you've got an infection in your mouth, and you think you've gotten rid of it. Because what happens is, people have a cavity, person have a cavity, right? And the doctor says, well, you need a root canal. So what they do is they drill down, drill out all the area they think, and take out the blood vessel in, in, in the nerve, and they fill it with a hardener. They put a disinfectant in with the idea of killing all of the infection. Then they put a hardener in, now you've got a hard tooth that you can still use. That's the concept. Now, let me digress a minute. Most of what dentists do is not good for you. I know people don't want to hear that. Most of what standard dentists do, fluoride dis inactivates the thyroid. You got fluoride toothpaste, fluoride treatment, right? 51% 50, of the filling that people, dentists use is mercury. Mercury is the second most toxic metal known to man behind plutonium. The only place you can use mercury now, you can't, for instance, you can't go buy, you go to Rite Aid or the Wal uh, Walgreens, you cannot buy a mercury thermometer anymore. You know that, right? I had to order mine from India. You can't buy them anymore because it's unsafe for po human population to deal with. The only place you can put mercury that's safe now is put in the per person's mouth. Make sense? The dentist can still put it in your mouth, but it's unsafe everywhere else. You understand what I'm saying to you? Okay. 
uh, a cap and a crown covers an infection. So you already got an infection, they just cover it up. Makes it look good. Because remember, the basic business model of dentistry is a pretty smile and no pain. So if a dentist can keep you out of pain and give you a pretty smile, he's going to make money. That's all that's necessary. Did somebody? Did, Free mic. Free, go ahead. My question is, um, I, have a, I have a relative, a cousin. Yeah. She's about 47 years old. She's currently on Coumadin for blood clots. Right. And that's been for maybe the last 10 years. Now her son, he's about 23, and he had a recent blood clot in his throat. Mm -hmm. So I want to know, is the Coumadin good for the blood clot, or is it something else herb-wise that they can do in regards to minimizing the, club, the blood clots, especially at his young age? Right. Uh, good question. First of all, you need to know that the blood is supposed to clot. It has to clot or we'd all bleed to death. So you have mechanisms in your system to make sure that your blood clots in a certain amount of time. What Coumadin does is it extends the amount of time it takes your blood to clot, okay? But you still got to clot. I had a woman that came to me years ago uh, who was from Temple, and uh, she was on Coumadin also. You know, Coumadin is rat poison. Y'all know that. So what they did was, they gave, now the standard dose of Coumadin is five milligrams to 7.5 milligrams every day. That's usually, sometimes 10, sometimes 10. This lady, this lady was on 40 milligrams of Coumadin a day. So I said to her, I said, Miss Caesar, they're killing you, you're gonna die. You can't take 40 milligrams of Coumadin. You were gonna to bleed to death. But she said, but the doctor told me, I, and here's what they were doing. I said, the doctor's problem is he's treating your blood clotting times. He's not treating you. He's going by how will your blood clotting times respond to his doses of cumulative. And as long as they don't respond, he's going to keep raising the dose. You can't take that much to kill you. And she died a few months later. But the bottom line is, you don't have blood clots because you don't have enough cumulative in your system. That's not why people clot. People clot because they don't have the other chemicals balanced in their body. All the electrolytes and electricity balance. That's what needs to be balanced. And remember I told you, every cell needs thyroid and all the, all the minerals. You get all those balanced out, people tend to do okay. Excuse me just a minute. Because we're on a time schedule, we're going to take it to just 1 o'clock. Now, we're going to ask you, no one else stand that other than those that are standing. That way, Dr. Burton can reach <laughs> you because... I'm pretty sure you're enjoying it. <laughs> so I got to get them back. So we only have 15 more minutes. So them that are standing, please just remain standing and no more new hands. All right? Try to make your question precise to the point so you can sit the up. Excuse me. Um, in regards to something natural, because he's had two attacks within the last two to three weeks, so what can they take natural or organically to help with the situation in regards to the blood clot? Okay, I'm gonna give you the response that Dr. Gundry says in his book. It's not so much what you add as what you give up. What's he taking? What's he doing right now? See, so understand something. Many times when patients come to me, they say, Dr. Burton, I feel sick. I say, well, what are you doing? Well, I take lisinopril, amlodipine, coumadin. Well, wouldn't you be sick if you took all that? So the first thing I want to do is get all the stuff I know make people sick out your system and see if you're still sick. Because people assume when the doctor gives them something, they got to take it the rest of their life. That's the business model of the drug industry. You got to take this for the rest of your life. You understand? So the first thing I want to know about anybody who's sick is what are you taking every day? What you putting in your mouth every day? And the other thing that really gets me un upset is that people will say, well, I take this every day, Doc. What's the name of it? I don't know. It's a little green. It's green, ain't it? It's, yeah. Green. What is it, though? I don't know. It's supposed to help my blood pressure. You don't know the name of something that's supposed to keep you alive? You need to know what that is. So he needs somebody to bring him to my office if he can't make it there himself so I can tell him what's going on with him. Because he needs, he needs the office visit. He needs an evaluation of what's going on with him. That's what he needs. If he's on Coumadin and he's that young, he got some stuff going on. Because it ain't going to get no better. Coumadin is not going to cure him. Coumadin is not a cure. It's to keep you from getting another blood clot right now. But the conditions that cause the clot in the first place ain't been changed. Who's next? Yellow mic. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, I was wondering if your herbals help um, inflammation, mucus, 
and uh, cancer of the uterus. You're saying, do the herbs help that? Uh-huh. Yeah, well, understand. Um, see, here's the thing. You have to understand how I approach medicine. Why did the person get the problem in the first place? In other words, see, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you ain't supposed to get all that stuff. See, I got involved in this medicine, this type of work, because my father was a very, very sick man. And when I saw how many things he was getting sick with at the ages he was getting sick with them, I wanted to find out how I could avoid that. And anything that helps you avoid it will help you get rid of it. You understand that, right? Okay. My father got sick at 51 years old. At least I thought that's when he got sick. But actually he got sick earlier than that when I started looking at it. The first thing I noticed my father got sick was, was his toothbrush was always pink. You know, you know, in the bathroom, maybe I got that toothbrushes around. Well, his was always pink. So I said, Dad, how come you got a pink toothbrush? He got pyrrhea, bleeding gums. Then, next thing I know, he had to have all his teeth taken out. Then he had high blood pressure. Then he had pancreatic cancer. Then he had diabetes. Then he had heart disease. Then he had prostate cancer. Then he had congestive heart failure, multiple heart attacks, and died after 18 years of all that. And I said, wait a minute, something wrong here. I went to his doctor, I said, doc, why is my father always sick? He said, ah, your father's the best patient I got. He does everything I tell him. I said, obviously you don't know what to tell him. So I decided to go to medical school and find out what was the deal. And I found out the deal. It's not that complicated. Now all my classmates thought I was crazy. You know, I graduated in 1981. I went to my 35-year med school reunion two years ago. Those of my classmates that are still alive don't think I'm crazy anymore. Because I told them in the 1970s, one day there's going to be health food supermarkets and people are going to be drinking bottled water. Guess what? Matter of fact, Bezos, Bezos just bought uh, 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 Whole Foods. That was my idea. Got to. There's nowhere to go. Everything we've maxed out. You all know it. All the cars look alike. You can't tell a 2017 from a 2007. They've maxed out. And you know, you guys grew up in the same time I grew up. Oh, we're going to have a wonder cure just, just, just in the future. We're just there. We're going to have a cure for this. No, they're not. They're not going to cure anything because it makes more money to treat than the cure. Cure is not part of the business model. So you need to understand that you got to dig down and start looking at what we can do to prevent this stuff. And the best way to prevent it is to eat better, learn what the food is about, because we need to be focusing on the food now. That's what it's really all about, the food. Yeah. Thank you. Who's that? Doctor? Yeah. I want to know if you believe that adrenal fatigue is real, and what type of thermometers do you want us to use? I'm so glad you asked that question. Dr. Tennant, one of my mentors, he says we should think of ourselves as a wagon being pulled by two horses. One is a thyroid and the other is the adrenal. Now, there are about 200 symptoms associated with underactive thyroid. The number one being fatigue. Guess what happened if you were riding in a wagon and the right horse falls out dead? Does anything different happen to that wagon than if the left horse falls out dead? Same thing. That's why adrenal is so mis misunderstood because it's the same symptoms. The main difference between people who have adrenal problems and thyroid problems is temperature, because thyroid controls body temperature. So if you want to differentiate, measure your temperature. A person who got low thyroid symptoms, but got great body temperature, low adrenal, okay? And, and here's why you don't hear much about adrenal glands. Adrenal glands sit on top of the kidneys. That's why they call them adrenal glands. They're added to the renals, which is the kidneys, adrenal. What's the number one hormone come from the adrenal glands? Adrenaline, right? You heard of adrenaline rush? Ba mother, baby gets stuck under the car, she picks the car, right? Adrenaline, right? Okay, have you ever heard anybody had their adrenals removed? Anyone here ever hear of your adrenals being removed? Right, because you can't live without them. Now how can you have something in your body that important and y'all don't know nothing about it? That's how it is. The doctors don't know much about it either. The good thing, though, is, is that there was a doctor who found out about a name, uh, um, I can't think of his name offhand, but he wrote a book called Safe Uses for Cortisol. And I heard him lecture in Pittsburgh in 1988, and I didn't believe him. But in 2005, I met a doctor who told me his stuff was right. I looked it up, 
read it again, started using it, he's absolutely right. People who have lower adrenal function need to be on cortisol, right? Cortisol is the, that hormone that comes from it that handles chronic stress, okay. The guy who figured out how to make cortisol in a cheap enough way so you could afford it is a man named Percy Julian, black chemist, considered to be a master chemist. You should look, look him up. His name Percy Julian, uh, 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 unforgotten genius, I think his name is the, 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 the DVD, but he's the one that made cortisol possible so that you could take cortisol. I have lots of patients on cortisol who got rid of their adrenal fatigue because of that. That's right. Good question. Thanks. Oh. First of all, I'd like to give thanks to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and also thank uh, Pastor Jennings for hosting such a seminar as this. We need these kind of seminars. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And then I'd like for the audience to know that uh, I happen to be a 20-year patient of the doctor who is speaking to us today. <laughs> I'm going to be as brief as I can. Some 20 years ago, I was having a prostate problem. I went to my regular doctor, introduced me to various urologists, and they all wanted to do surgery on me. And I'm anti-surgery. That's the kind of person I am. And so I heard about Dr. Burton. And I went to him, and he started telling me different things that I could take to help my situation. My numbers were as high as 400. Now, if it's over two, the urologists are alarmed. I've met people whose numbers were up to 1,000. A lot of exaggeration is on that. But when you get before a, a doctor who practiced holistic health, who knows how to treat the body with the things that God has given us from the ground from which we've come, a lot of difference is made. I did not have to take chemotherapy. I didn't have to take radiation. Some years later, I wind up with a cancer on my spine called plasmacytoma. They told me if I didn't take the radiation or the chemo, I would become paralyzed. That was two years ago. I go see my doctor. My doctor said, here's what I want you to take. He gave me baking soda and told me to buy organic maple syrup. One part baking soda, three parts syrup in a pot, right. heat it, uh, chill it, take a tablespoon every day with the vitamins and minerals that he gave me. Now, before that, I was on three morphines a day in the hospital for three weeks. They couldn't figure out what to do. Then finally, they, they said they were going to give me the chemo or the radiation. Well, after seeing Dr. Burton, I decided I wasn't going back to the hospital. <laughs> I'm going to close with this. Here I am now, two years later. I'm not paralyzed. No pain in my back. And I was on three morphines a day. I, I followed his advice, and in a week, no more pain. And here I am. So I can tell you all the stories. But, but the pastor said, we're out of here by 1 o'clock. So I'm going to pass the mic on. God bless you, Doc. God bless you, Pastor. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend Gallant Shaw. I appreciate that. Who's next? Thank you for coming. I have a question about um, how should I take my um, pre uh, my um, breast my breast exams, and what's the best route? And also, I had my gallbladder taken out. They're telling me I didn't need it. Now I know better. God gave it to me. I sure need it. But what? Um, what kind of danger I'm in without a gallbladder, and I don't poop, and they tell me that's normal for me. Tell me, how can that be normal? I'm not sick. It's been over since 2006, and I, I don't use the bathroom regularly. Are you saying that somebody wants to take your gallbladder out? It's gone. It's gone? You say your gallbladder's gone? Yes. Am I, uh, I, am I in danger? It's been since 2006. I have no symptoms. I'm not in pain or anything. Okay, that's good. Now, would you, you had your gallbladder removed because you had stones or cancer? Stones. Stones. Okay. I'm glad you, you mentioned one. That, what was the first thing you mentioned? Because it was something I, that was I, I, It's time for me to take um, my exams. I don't want to go back and take one until I've talked to you on how, what method do I take for your exams, the exams. What's the best route? Oh, right, exam. That's, that's right. That's what I want. Good two questions. Breast exams, uh, mammograms are overrated. 
Uh, the best way to screen for breast disease is thermography. Therm, T-H-E-R-M, like a thermometer. It, it's like, when you, you're familiar with the technology of night vision where you can see heat? Well, they can actually pick up evidence of breast cancer up to 10 years before mammography would. Uh, it, tumors have to have increased blood supply. So the area, the area where the tumor is growing will have more blood supply than the area surrounding it. More blood brings more heat. That heat is picked up on the thermography. They can pick that up real easy and quickly. And there's no, it's like taking a picture of you with uh, your cell phone. It's, there's no radiation, no nothing. So uh, if you just look that up, Google thermography. There's a gentleman named Getson in southern Jersey that does it. Um, but that's, that's the, and then the other thing was, um, what, I forgot the other piece you were mentioning. That was important too? My gallbladder being taken out. Gallbladder, that's right, gallbladder. I gotta forget that. I wanted to mention this. Your gallbladder's gone. Uh, you know, we can't say anything about yours. If you have a gallbladder and you have a gallbladder problem, don't take it out. You need to do a liver gallbladder flush and you can pass them out within five to seven days in the toilet without any consequences. I had a woman, 41 years old, die of post-op complications of gallbladder removal when I was an intern. I mean, I was, I was chief resident at Providence Hospital, and I said to myself, one day I gotta find a way to avoid that. And I haven't seen a person with gallbladder surgery over 30 years as a result of knowing how to do a liver gallbladder flush. Go ahead, who's next? Go ahead. Uh, greetings, doctor. Greetings. From a futuristic environmental standpoint, um, being that our ozone layer is ongoingly being destroyed, have you shared any of your research with uh, NASA uh, in their plight to, to seek other life planets? Uh, I'm asking, what I'm asking is, what does our future Earth look like medically? Will it be diseases? Will, will it be like what it is now? Well, with our people. Let me answer that by saying this. I heard a gentleman say uh, last year that if we focused our economy on taking care of the planet, everybody have a job. Because we got to take care of the planet. Uh, we, we're doing some crazy things to it. And uh, right now, uh, we got somebody in the White House that is running NASA. So NASA ain't interested right now in doing anything positive on that, that tune. But, no, but I appreciate where you're coming from. People have always, always asked me, Doc, does everybody, everybody needs to know about this, but you have to remember that everything's political. They're not really interested in these things because they don't make a lot of money. Got to make money if they're for them to be really interested. Anybody else? Thank you, doctor. Um, according to my family doctor, I'm healthy. I don't take no medications. Um, you don't medication. take medications? No, nothing. Good. I'm not sick, so, but my mom died from breast cancer five years ago. Right. My twin sister, she had thyroid cancer. Thyroid cancer, And right. she's here, but... Um, they took your thyroid out? Yeah, that's what they did. So, with that in mind, what should I do to prevent myself from getting breast the, cancer? You should do the same thing I'm doing. Okay. Essential fats, minerals, vitamin D, thyroid and iodine. Okay. And so we're from Canada. Can you come to Canada to do a Can I come seminar, to <laughs> seminar for us? <laughs> we, could, we have to talk about that. You, yes. Now you have no thyroid. You're taking, so you're taking Synthroid? You're taking iodine? No. You need to take iodine. You're taking vitamin D? Good. You got to take vitamin D. And one more thing. Where can we get your tablets? Oh, you can get method. Call my office. I'll give some of my cards later. So Call the office. Get we get you some. Yeah, yeah. We can get you. Okay. No problem. It's one of We got the grip. Yeah. Thank Dr. Bird for being here. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, before you go, you that want information about his office, we have a stack of business cards up here. Um, you can get one from his wife. Just step up and you can get them right up here. We, God willing, we're going to try to organize another seminar once me and my brother get together because we would love to be able to address just men. And we love because you know some men got problems they want to talk about. <laughs> so we would love to get a chance to address men and we love to come back and have another separate seminar to just address women. But again, we're glad you enjoyed it.
what we're looking to do, this will be on DVD. And it will be available. Not only that, we also going to take this lecture and air it. It'll be aired nationwide on our telecast. That way you'll be able to see it. So, let us give Dr. Burton a half a million. Thank you, thank you. Thank, you, thank God for you. Appreciate it. We're going to ask you all to stand. The city is self-dismissed. Please remember, evening service starts at 5 o'clock. You. you can come get some business cards right here. I'm going to get the business One card. One per person, please. Thank you.